Vamos a ver, hora 7.43 de la mañana, día, ¿qué día es hoy? Día 4 de junio 2023, domingo. Estamos en el refugio de Juanar y vamos a echar a andar al gran paseo. Aquí tengo mi mochilita. Mira, puedo estar bien. Segundo intento, a this start. It was a full start. But a good one. The tres picos, that is encouraging. First time.
Sierra Blanca. It says here. from reddish brown to bright yellow. They're way lit by crystals appearing as lighted globes. They continue through the lava gallery which gently sloped until they reached the intersection of two roads. Without hesitation, Professor Liddenbrook chose the Eastern Tunnel and the journey continued through a succession of arches appearing before them as if they were the aisles of a Gothic cathedral. The walls were enhanced with impressions of rock weeds and mosses from the Silurian Epoch. The eastern route they had taken had come to a dead end. With three days' walk back to the fork to find Arne Saknussem's original route, they found their water rations were limited to one day. Knowing their only chance of finding water was on that route, they set off for the fork, and there, finally, they fell, almost lifeless, on the third day. After sleep, they continued down the other tunnel in their quest for water, and while searching on his own, Hans the guide heard the sound of water thundering behind a granite wall and with a pickaxe attacked the wall so as to allow a stream of boiling water to enter and cool in their tunnel. Not only had they found life in the water, but they'd also found a flowing guide to the center of the earth. They called the stream the Hansbach.
Replenished with the water, the journey continued with haste, but somehow they find themselves separated. Professor Lidenbrook's nephew, Axel, found himself alone. His mind was seized with unparalleled fear, and he saw memories of home flashing before him. His fiancée, Grobe, his house and friends in Hamburg. He saw hallucinations of all the incidents of the journey. And unworthy as he felt, he knelt in fervent prayer, and then in panic, he ran blindly through a tunnel, only to reach a dead end, where he fell panting for breath. In the darkness, he cried. Voices, 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 he heard voices. He heard his uncle's voice. Due to the shape of the gallery and the conducting power of the rocks, his uncle's voice was uncannily traveling around the walls. And by means of their chronometers, they discovered they were four miles apart. So Axel set about the task of rejoining the professor and their guide. <coughs> You can actually follow the rhythm. That I do sometimes this stuff too when I run or walk. I find a good rhythm and I follow it with the music. Bam, 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 bam. Oh! 
Here's the split, I think. Across a forest at some point, so this must be it. We've already done sand, but it was low trees, so this must be it. And only when we come out the other end, we're like no more trees. And in silence, they waited for the storm. For four days, the storm had raged as they clung to the mast of their raft for safety. Finally, 
with their raft wrecked after being smashed against the reefs. They lay sheltered from the pouring rain beneath a few overhanging rocks where they ate. What a great walk. Some forest. Yeah. Some mountain. Yeah, this is perfect now. Sun. And in the way back, it'll be really nice to get in back into the forest with the shade and the yeah. Now the elevation really kind of starts at this point. Admiring shades of lava, which imperceptibly passed from reddish brown to bright yellow. Their way lit by crystals appearing as lighted globes. They continued through the lava gallery, which gently sloped until they reached the intersection of two roads. Without hesitation, Professor Lidenbrook chose the eastern tunnel, and the journey continued through a succession of arches appearing before them as if they were the eyes of a gothic cathedral.
the walls were enhanced with impressions of rock walls and mosses from the Silurian epoch. taken had come to a dead end. With three days walk back to the fork to find Arne Saknussen's original route, they found their water rations were limited to one day. Knowing their only chance of finding water was on that route, they set off for the fork. And there, finally, they fell almost lifeless on the third day. After sleep, they continued down the other tunnel in their quest for water. And whilst searching on his own, Hans the guide heard the sound of water thundering behind a granite wall, and with a pickaxe, attacked the wall so as to allow a stream of boiling water to enter and cool in their tunnel. Not only had they found life in the water, but they had also found a flowing guide to the center of the earth. They called the stream the Hansbach.
Replenished with water, the journey continued with haste, but somehow they found themselves separated. Professor Lindenbrook's nephew Axel found himself alone. His mind was seized with unparalleled fear, and he saw memories of home flashing before him. His fiancée, Groibel, his house and friends in Hamburg. He saw hallucinations of all the incidents of the journey, and, unworthy as he felt, he knelt in fervent prayer. from his prayer. In panic, he ran blindly through a tunnel only to reach a dead end where he fell panting for breath. In the darkness, he cried. Voices. 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 He heard voices. He heard his uncle's voice. Due to the shape of the gallery and the conducting power of the rocks, his uncle's voice was uncannily traveling around the world. Here we're gonna slow down a bit because it gets steeper.
suddenly the ground disappeared from beneath his feet. He fell down a vertical shaft, his head hitting a sharp rock. He lost consciousness. On opening his eyes, he found himself with the professor and their guide. And looking around him, he saw an ocean stretching as far as the eye could see. A giant forest of mushrooms, a line of huge cliffs, and strange clouds hung overhead as he lay on a deeply indented shore of golden sand strewn with shells. For a moment, he thought that he was back on the surface of the earth, but soon realized that they had reached a world within a world. You can jog a little. <laughs> sí. Having made a raft from wood taken from the giant mushroom forest, with rigging consisting of a mast made of two staves lashed together, a yard made of a third, and a sail borrowed from their stock of rugs, they set sail from the harbour, Port Groiben, named after Axel's fiance. With a northwesterly wind propelling them along at about three miles an hour, silvery beams of light reflected here and there by drops of spray produced luminous points in the eddy created by the raft. Soon, all land was lost to view. Five days out to sea, they witnessed a terrifying battle between two sea monsters, one having the snout of a porpoise, the head of a lizard, and the teeth of a crocodile, an ichthyosaurus. The other, the mortal enemy of the first, a serpent with a turtle shell, the Plesiosaurus.
So we started about an hour ago from the hotel. Okay, perfect. It's about an hour. <laughs> so that's right, yeah. So it was at 15 then. Further on, they reach the edge of a huge forest made up of vegetation of the tertiary period. Tall palms were linked by a network of inextricable creepers. A carpet of moss covered the ground, and the leaves were colorless, everything having a brownish hue. Exploring the forest, they discovered a herd of gigantic animals, mastodons, which were being marshaled by a primitive human being, a proteus. He stood over 12 feet high, and he brandished an enormous bow, a crook worthy of this antediluvian shepherd.
dumb with astonishment and amazement, which bordered on stupefaction, they fled the forest. Instinctively, they made toward the Lidenbrook Sea. Discovering a rusty dagger on the beach and the carved initials of the explorer before them on a slab of granite, they realized that they were once again treading the route of Arne Satmusum. Following a short sea journey around the Cape, they came ashore where a dark tunnel plunged deep into the rock. Venturing down, their progress was halted by a piece of rock blocking their way. After deciding to blow their way through and setting the charge, they put out to sea for safety. With the explosion, the rocks before them opened like a curtain and a bottomless pit appeared in the shore. The explosion had caused an earthquake. The abyss had opened up and the sea was pouring into it. Down and down they plunged into the huge gallery, but on regaining their senses, found their raft rising at tremendous speed. Trapped in the shaft of an active volcano, they rose through the ages of man to be finally expelled out of the mountainside, riddled with tiny lava streams. Their journey was completed, and they found themselves 3,000 miles from their original starting point in Iceland. They had entered by one volcano, and they had come out by another. With the blue mountains of Calabria in the east, they walked away from the mountain that had returned them. The frightening Mount Etna. Straight, basically, unless there's a sign or something. Look, there's a mark. All right, we're in the clear.
No great disability. It's hazy. We're gonna have to weather it. of a life on earth go flashing past of home of Grogan friends of whom he seen his last contemplating what his life's been worth while trapped beneath the earth an embryo Of caverns where no other man has ever been Solarian epoch moves me as my grave My final bow I wave A life too late to save Crystals of a pink 
disappeared from beneath his feet. He fell down a vertical shaft, his head hitting a sharp rock. He lost consciousness. On opening his eyes, he found himself with the professor and the guide. And looking around him, he saw an ocean stretching as far as the eye could see. A giant forest of mushrooms, a line of huge cliffs, and strange clouds hung overhead as he lay on a deeply indented shore of golden sand strewn with shells. For a moment he thought he was back on the surface of the earth, and he soon realized that they had reached a world within a world. Having made a raft from wood taken from the giant mushroom forest, with rigging consisting of a mast made of two staves lashed together, a yard made of a third and a sail borrowed from their stock of rugs, they set sail from the harbour, Port Graubin, named after Axel's fiancée. With a northwesterly wind propelling them along at about three miles an hour, silvery beams of light reflected here and there by drops of spray produced luminous points in the eddy created by the raft. Soon, all land was lost to view. But five days out to sea, they witnessed a terrifying battle between two sea monsters. One having the snout of a porpoise, the head of a lizard, and the teeth of a crocodile, an ichthyosaurus. And the other, the mortal enemy of the first, a serpent with a turtle shell, the plesiosaurus.
<laughs> go away, go. Go away, go. Cumulus clouds formed heavily in the south, like huge wool packs heaped up in picturesque disorder. Under the influence of the breezes, they merged together, growing darker, forming a single menacing mass. The raft lay motionless on the sluggish, waveless sea. And in silence, they waited for the storm. <laughs> For days the storm had raged as they clung to the mast of their raft for safety. Finally, with their raft wrecked after being bashed against the reefs, they lay sheltered from the pouring rain beneath a few overhanging rocks where they ate and slept. The next day, all trace of the storm had disappeared, and what remained of their stock Take your time, of course. Take as much the time as you need. No rush whatsoever. It showed that the change of wind during the storm had returned them to just a few miles north of Port Graubin. Deciding to try I'll and find the original route, they advanced with difficulty over granite fragments mingled with flint, quartz, and alluvial deposits, eventually reaching a plain covered with bones like a huge cemetery. A mile further on, they reached the edge of a huge forest made up of vegetation of the tertiary period. The I think this is the hard part, yes. 
<laughs> I mean, this boss. part in general. Yeah. The leaves were colorless, everything having a brownish hue. Exploring Let's the take forest, your time. We'll, we'll, we'll make it. If we find it too difficult, we can always turn around. Being marshaled by a primitive human being. So far, Protest. for me, it's okay. He stood over 12 foot high, and he brandished an enormous bow. There's someone coming up there, see? I've been here once, like maybe 13 years ago. <laughs> I did it once <laughs> with more people. But I haven't been living back in Marbella for many years, so not only now I'm back and I have time. And... Main thing is not to twist your ankle because yeah. that's a horrible yeah. way back. Yeah. My name is Sergio, by the way. Running. It's nice to meet you, Kara. Good on you, man. <laughs> hey. stupefaction they fled the forest instinctively they made towards the Liddenbrook sea discovering a rusty dagger on the beach and the carved initials of the explorer before them on a slab of granite they realized that they were once again treading the route of Arne Saknussen following a short sea journey around a cape they came ashore where a dark tunnel plunged deep into rock and venturing down their progress was halted by a piece of rock blocking their way after deciding to blow their way through and setting the charge, they put out to sea for safety. With the explosion, the rocks before them opened like a curtain and a bottomless pit appeared in the shore. The explosion had caused an earthquake. The abyss had opened up and the sea was pouring into it. Down and down they plunged into the huge gallery, but on regaining their senses found their raft rising at tremendous speed. Trapped in the shaft of an active volcano, they rose through the ages of man be finally expelled out on a mountainside riddled with tiny lava streams. Their journey was completed, and they found themselves 3,000 miles from their original starting point in Iceland. They had entered by one volcano, and they had come out by another. With the blue mountains of Calabria in the east, they walked away from the mountain that had returned them, the frightening Mount Etna.
can't believe all those people did this at night, Philip. With a little light. Although we're not going to get very many views if this goes on like this. But that's cool. We'll come back in a helicopter. We must be almost there. Good evening. Uh, do not attempt to adjust your radio. There is nothing wrong. We have taken control as to bring you this special show. Uh, we will return it to you as soon as you are grooving. Uh, welcome to station W-E-F-U-N-K, better known as We, we Funk, Funk, or deeper still, the Mothership Connection, home of the extraterrestrial brothers, dealers we of funk. funk music, P-Funk, Uncut Funk, The Bomb. Coming to you directly from the mothership. Top of the chocolate Milky Way. 500,000 kilowatts of P-Funk power. So kick back, dig, while we do it to you in your eardrums. For oh, me, I'm known as Lollipop Man, alias the long-haired sucker. My motto is... Make mine the P-Funk. I'm on my funk uncut. <laughs> yeah, make my funk the P-Funk. I want to get funked up. Now this is what I want y'all to do. If you got faults, defects, or shortcomings, you know, like arthritis, rheumatism, or migraines, whatever part of your body it is, I want you to lay it on your radio. Let the vibes flow through. Funk not only moves, it can remove. Dig? The desired effect is what you get when you improve your interplanetary functionship. Sir Lollipop Man. 
chocolate coated freaking habit form. Doing it to you in 3D. So groovy that I dig me. Once upon a time called now. Somebody say, is there funk after death? I say it's seven up. <laughs> yeah.
Struggle. 